All right, and we're going to get going. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Nancy Walters. I'm the Executive Director of the La Jolla Community Center. We're happy to welcome Dr. Ben Naiman. He's the Director of Medicinal Plants Research of Department of Science and Conservation at the San Diego Botanic Garden. He will be discussing medicinal plants, research, and drug discovery, lessons from the past, and plants for the future. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to tell you a little bit about the La Jolla Community Center. If you're new here, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. We're a nonprofit organization with a mission to provide programs and services that promote lifelong learning, wellness, and friendship. We have, um, we have programs all um, the whole week. We have everything from speaker series. We have daily classes like Zumba, yoga, and language classes. We have wonderful events like um, jazz concerts, and we have Opera Wednesdays too. That's once a month. Lots of great programs, and we invite you to join us and welcome, and we welcome you back. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you to please use the chat, um, the chat function to submit any questions that you may have for Dr. Naiman, and we'll review those questions at the end of the presentation. Now, with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Naiman. Dr. Naiman is a natural product scientist who devotes his energy to researching the chemical components of medicinal plants and marine organisms to better understand how they can be used to improve human health. Prior to joining San Diego Botanic Garden, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, Ben worked in American and Chinese universities, a major multinational flavor and fragrance company, and co-founded and managed two preclinical drug development startup companies. Ben has, a long time, has been a longtime member of the American Chemical Society, the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, and the American Association for the, Advance, the Advancement of Science. Ben more recently joined the San Diego Botanical Society, San Diego Diplomacy Council, and the Society for Ethnobotany. Ben is an author or co-author for over 50 published journal articles, book chapters, and awarded patents. He is a well-traveled invited speaker and has been recognized with awards and fellowships, honorary academic appointments, and professional society leadership positions for over the years. Dr. Naiman, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me and also for a very, very kind introduction. Um, sometimes it's interesting to hear our own careers read back to us, um, but it's it's nice to also see a lot of faces. I see some familiar names and faces on the call, um, which is always a joy for me uh, as I can share what I do professionally with some people uh, in, our, in our local community. So let me just figure out how to share our screen here. I know we're a couple of years into this pandemic, but still technology. So let's see, Nancy, can you just confirm for me that we're seeing my cover slide there? Yep, we see it. Excellent, thank you. Recently, I saw a whole Zoom presentation that was just a slide that didn't advance. It was very frustrating, so we're not gonna have those problems today. Um, as Nancy mentioned, so uh, I'm here at San Diego Botanic Garden, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do here, as well as the, the sort of background of the whole field of research that I work in. Um, I do want to mention that uh, the Department of Science and Conservation that I'm a part of has really only existed at San Diego Botanic Garden for a couple years now as the garden goes through some periods of growth and change. I don't mean that in terms of the, the name change from Quail Botanic Garden to San Diego Botanic Garden. That actually happened about 10 or 15 years ago. and um, Yeah, time is hard to keep track of in San Diego sometimes. So we get a lot of questions about where we are. And so I thought I would put a little slide here that'll show that. We're up the, the I-5 from y'all in, in La Jolla, but we're located in Encinitas. Um, the street name has not been updated by the city, so we're still on Quail Gardens Drive, uh, right there at the corner of Eki Ranch Road. And sometimes you'll see farmer's markets up here, the Heritage Museum, and some other things across the street. We are open um, for visitors from Wednesday to Monday, and, and that does mean, yes, closed on Tuesdays. That's going to give our outstanding staff and uh, volunteer team the time and space they really need to keep everything beautiful without distracting too much um, from our visitor experiences. And I'm, I'm also very happy to say that um, just last year, the San Diego Botanic Garden was, was honored to have been named a three-time winner in the, the Union Tribune's uh, user-voted or user-selected best of. And so we were voted as San Diego's best scenic spot, best hiking trail, uh, and Best Museum. Others have awarded us Best Wedding Venue, and um, so there's really a lot to see and do if you're coming up here. Uh, please, if you haven't had a chance, come by. Um, I, I guarantee you could spend all day, all week, or, or even just an hour or two here, and you'll enjoy it regardless. 
Well, as you might have guessed, we're also plant people because this is a botanic garden uh, and we love plants. And so what do we love about plants? Well, this is a, a kind of cartoon image that's taken off of a, a kid's learning Zoom, uh, sorry, kid's learning YouTube video. Um, and it, it's really highlighting that plants are offering us a lot of things. A lot of times what we think of is their, their beauty, um, the air that we breathe, the shade that we sit under and the ecosystem that that really provides in nature but also a lot of the materials that we've used to construct things in our society, as well as foods, consumer product ingredients, uh, and medicines, which of course is really the focus of my talk today. And to get into that, I really want to reorient our view on systems of medicine, because even with, with my sort of early to middle age here, um, things have changed over the years. And I grew up in a time where Traditional and Western medicines were defined, almost defined really, um, as being alternative approaches to medicine. And I don't like that word. I don't like that word for a lot of reasons. I think words have, have meaning and power. And so if one is alternative to the other, right, that inherently means that the two are going to be competing. People are going to assume that one's better and one's worse. And that may not really be the case. And so there's been a regime change and a language style change that now we talk about these as being complementary to each other, that your traditional medicines and your Western medicines are really medicines. Um, and I put these in quotation marks because I don't like the term traditional. It's still being used. World Health Organization says about 80% of the world's population is using traditional medicines. And that can be herbal medicines, but also lifestyle things like acupuncture, yoga, um, some of the indigenous therapies that we wouldn't think of necessarily as medicine, but as food, um, and, and other things that also fall under that category. And I don't also like the term Western medicine, because Western medicine is not only being used in the West, and it also implies that these two things are very different, whereas they're really not in a lot of cases. So what we're seeing today is that Western medicine has grown out of traditional medicine with a lot of the lessons learned from the past, the FDA now recognizes botanical drug products that we'll talk about later. We have many natural products, purified molecules that come from medicinal plants that are used in so-called Western medicines. And Western medicines that used to be considered as purified single entities are actually in many cases being given as combinational or cocktail therapies, much more like an herbal mixture would have been. And Western medicine is also giving back to traditional medicine, not only because people seeking cures go to one after exhausting options on the other, they're looking for ways to balance out some of the side effects of Western medicines by taking dietary supplements and herbal medicines. And Western doctors and scientists are defining the molecular mechanisms of disease and therapy, which is actually informing new uses of traditional medicine, so drug repurposing something that's become very hot and favored in the pharmaceutical industry is actually happening day to day with indigenous and traditional healers. And very similarly, it shouldn't be a surprise, we're connecting emerging diseases, okay, so COVID-19 is a primary example, something that didn't exist in the past, but all of a sudden is dramatically affecting our population, and connecting these new emerging diseases to pre-existing knowledge. So how could there be a traditional medicine that would treat COVID-19? Well, no one had ever seen it before, but we have seen viruses. We do know about respiratory disorders. And so different herbal therapies might actually have some sort of benefit for treatment and have been used throughout the entire pandemic by people around the world. Some with efficacy and unfortunately many without. So, when we think about these medicines that we're calling as traditional, they're actually very ancient. Early documentation of the use of medicinal plants comes back thousands and thousands of years. But we know that in addition to the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, the Chinese and Indians, and yes, even the Greco-Romans in what we consider to be the West, all peoples of the world in every culture have looked out into nature for medicine. Not everybody has taken the steps of writing it down or documenting it well. Most of these, I don't want to say many, most of these have just been knowledge that's been passaged down the generations, either inside of the family or through a training system 
of apprenticeship to the healers of the village, for example, or of the entire population. Some of these are extremely formal systems. We just don't have access to them because we're not inside of that society. But even among the knowledge that was being written and recorded, we think about the Greek and Roman knowledge that was documented in 500 before the Common Era. So 2,500 years ago, most of that knowledge actually could have been lost to the ages, right? Because it became popular some thousand years later during what we call the Dark Ages to burn books and forsake knowledge. But luckily for us, and, and realistically, luckily for the entire world, Islamic scholars on well-established trade routes were collecting this knowledge all throughout time and history, preserving that knowledge and certainly translating it. And around 1000, the year 1000, Abu Ben Sena, or what we could write as Avicenna, is a Persian pharmacist that came along and actually coordinated all of this medical knowledge, everything that was available to him at the time, with everything else known from India, from China, from the Middle East, including Persian and Egyptian knowledge, okay, and then published a compendium that he called the Canon of Medicine. And this five volume book series is probably, you know, huge. You can buy it today on Amazon for $1,000, so that should say something. This was actually used throughout the known world, the old world, for 600 or so, 600 or 700 years in every hospital, in every doctor's office, and once schools and universities became available, also being taught to medical practitioners there. So just an incredible, tremendous wealth of this knowledge, which also highlights that all medicine to that point was what we would call traditional medicine. So why do we call Western medicine as Western, even though the Western Europeans were using traditional medicine? Only around 200 years ago, pharmacists began to isolate or purify what we call the active principles from medicinal plants and mushrooms and other things that had been used in the so-called traditional medicines, right? So now all of a sudden, they have the capability to have a purified substance. The primary example was the discovery of morphine from the opium poppy, Papaver somniferum, which Sir Turner reported in 1805. And it's interesting because it wasn't even until 120 years later that the structure of morphine was known. And you're gonna see some chemical structures. I hope it doesn't throw you too far back into organic chemistry in college or entry chemistry in, in college or high school. Um, but these are incredibly complicated molecules in many cases, things that a chemist wouldn't necessarily dream up, but nature has provided us. And that same chemistry is what gives the efficacy to the medicinal plant. Okay, and so it became popular to purify more and more new molecules over the course of the 1800s, and certainly many more since, which created the foundation for Western medicine. So a couple other examples that I highlight on this slide are the discovery of quinine from the cinchona bark. This is a story that we hear about a lot. So that was done by Pelletier and Cavento. The same pharmacists isolated caffeine from coffee and from tea. So coffee arabica and camellia sinensis. I'm drinking some of this today. I drink some of this almost every day and most of America is addicted to one or the other, right? So this is a molecule that we've now had a relationship with for thousands of years that we're able to purify and understand what it does in our system through pharmacology. Another very early example of natural products research going into Western medicine is the discovery by Piria of salicylaldehyde, a molecule from the salic species or, or willow tree. It readily is converted into salicylic acid. That's a natural process. But by in introducing synthetic chemistry, Gerhard was able to create acetyl salicylic acid simply by boiling with vinegar or using uh, similar structures of molecules. Producing acetyl salicylic acid is the step that led into medicinal chemistry, okay? And that molecule can also be named as aspirin 
It was commercialized in 1899, and we've been using it for over 120 years. So you can see the long-term and large impacts that some of these would have. And there were plenty of other molecules discovered in the 1800s and 1900s that I won't bore you with, um, but I do know a lot about and have taught classes. So if anyone has particular questions, we can try to talk about those afterwards. So how has this discovery by these Western pharmacists in Italy, in France, in Germany, in the UK, um, really changed how we look at drug discovery? Well, there's this term called bioprospecting, which is really just going out to look for value in our nature. And so from the dawn of human civilization up through the 1900s, most of us were really working with terrestrial plants and fungi, things that you could readily see, pick, get your hands on. If you were lucky, maybe cultivate some of those, right? So the opium poppy has been something that even entire wars were fought over because of the huge value of the opium and the morphine unfortunately, sometimes for nefarious purposes. Another example of medicinal chemistry is what happens when we take morphine, which is a natural product shown here on the left, and purify it, but then derivatize it through synthetic chemistry into heroin. And believe it or not, this was actually done on purpose. It was named as heroin because it was so heroically potent as a painkiller that the going hypothesis at the time was that this would alleviate all of the pressure on morphine and get people off of this addictive substance. And it was years or even decades before it was pulled for the market. The addiction potential of heroin was recognized, huge damage had been done to society, and there is no putting the genie back into the bottle. But as we go on through time, not only traditional terrestrial plants, traditional medicines, and fungi have been used, that's ongoing even through today. But all of a sudden, about 100 years ago, we hit the golden era of antibiotics, right? And so we've got the discovery of penicillin from these penicillium molds. This is a, fun, a fungal natural product that can treat bacterial infections. And all of a sudden, the world has completely changed. Scientists began to ask questions about what else could be out there and what those chemistries and biologies could do for human society. And so certainly earlier than the 1970s, but with the development of scuba around that time, marine science became a lot more interesting in the, in the pharmaceutical field. People were looking at macroorganisms like puffer fish, tunicates, sponges, sea hares, and indeed some of these had been used in antiquity. We can find historical records, even from Pliny the Elder of studying organisms that had been taken out of the ocean in India and transported across the trade routes, either as poisons or as medicines. The pufferfish produces this molecule called tetrodotoxin you may have heard of. People think about getting fugu at their sushi restaurant, having a little bit of tingling sensation, but you know that you can't take too much of this molecule because it'll paralyze you, which is what the fish is using it for in its own ecology. It's being investigated today in clinical trials as a painkiller that would be a non-opiate and potentially non-addictive. As time has gone on and technology is being refined, we're in the genomics era now, or some people like to call the post-genomics era, even though we're still doing genomics. And more and more research on terrestrial microorganisms is being done, but also a huge amount on marine microorganisms. So when I moved to San Diego, I was working at Scripps Institution of Oceanography there in La Jolla, and this is a marine microorganism that has been extensively studied by several of the other labs there. So Selenospora tropica, it's a bacteria. It produces a molecule called Selenosporamide A. The structure is shown here on the bottom right. And this molecule is in, I believe, currently phase three clinical trials for a glioblastoma or a type of brain cancer that is very hard to treat by anything else that we have access to. So we've gotten a little bit away from traditional medicines but recognizing the value of things that are in nature that potentially may not have been known to traditional people or populations of ancient times. And altogether, when we look at the drug approvals over roughly the last 40 years, it's not just that molecules that initiated Western medicine were coming from, from nature and from traditional medicinal plants, 
but also even in the recent decades, we're still seeing a vast contribution to the pharmacopoeia of drugs that come from nature. And so what you're seeing on this slide in the, bi in the bar chart, on the green side are unmodified natural products, a relatively small percentage of the drugs that are approved each year, botanical mixtures that I promised we'll talk about and we'll come to in a few minutes, as well as these semi-synthetic derivatives of natural products, which are much more popular. We can make small changes to the structures that really benefit us in terms of making the molecules more drug-like or more beneficial for use as medicines than potentially they're being produced for by the organisms in their own ecology. So we think about a lot of plants producing molecules to interact with animals, with insects, potentially with other plants, and that's not necessarily what's gonna best benefit us for human medicine. So we make small structural changes. Some of our molecules are actually synthetic in nature, but they're inspired by natural products. They incorporate substructures of those natural molecules, so we can call it an active moiety, or they mimic how those natural molecules bind to different proteins in our body, okay? There's about an equal share of the drugs that are approved each year, which are totally synthetic, had nothing to do with nature at this point, and we value those as well. Again, this is all complementary approaches to discovery, so we encourage people to make new drugs and to utilize the new drugs that are out there. This is only beneficial for society. It doesn't have to be natural. It can be synthetic. It's okay. They're going through the same rigorous testing procedures. And similarly, we have about a quarter of the pie slice there that are vaccines, antibodies, and other biologicals. And some people like to call those as being natural, and some people don't. And so we really focus on the small molecules that are not large proteins. So what does this look like from a biological perspective? There's this concept of the central dogma of biology. The genetic code of life is our DNA, and DNA can be transcribed into RNA. RNA is translated into proteins. Normally your biology class stops there and your biochemistry class or organic chemistry class picks up and tells you that proteins can produce chemistry, okay? So proteins are really well known, especially uh, you know, after the last couple of years, as being antibodies, as being structural proteins. In the case of COVID-19, there's this spike protein that everyone talks about. Um, we think of them readily as uh, nutrient transport and storage molecules. So like hemoglobin that's bringing oxygen through our bloodstreams, messengers that are sending signals either between organisms or inside of our vasculature. But as well, as I mentioned, there are these proteins called enzymes, which are like little factories, and they're gonna be producing chemistry. And those chemicals can be primary metabolites. So what we think of as our basic needs for life, our amino acids to build proteins, sugars and fats for energy and storage and things like that. Um, but they can also be specialized metabolites. Some of our steroids and our hormones, um, pheromones, the things you smell, the things you taste in different plants and fruits. And those specialized metabolites, as we define them, have some role in nature. They interact with receptors and biological systems. Receptors are another type of proteins that recognize chemicals and send signals based on the binding of those molecules. And this is how most of our pharmacopoeia is understood. The chemistry is interacting with the biology and at that interface, what would have historically been considered as magic, that's what's happening. So you're here to hear about some of the success stories, some of the lessons that we've learned uh, before we get into talk about what we're doing here at the garden today. So a well-known example of a natural product that has really changed the world in, in profound ways is quinine. And quinine is an anti-malarial drug molecule, which was isolated from the bark of cinchona. And the picture shown here is cinchona officinalis, and anytime you see the binomial name that includes officinalis, this owes to the tradition of use of that plant in medicine or potentially in food or some other ethnobotanical purpose. But for the most part, when we think of food as being medicine, they were used in both, but not necessarily in the same ways. All right. 
So cinchona bark was used by indigenous peoples for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It was brought over to Europe and introduced in a powdered form as a drug. You could make a tea out of the, the bark um, in 1632. And it wasn't until 1820, as I told you a few moments ago, that quinine was isolated in pure form. All right, at that point, quinine overtook the Western market. So throughout Western Europe. And for about 90 years was used as an anti-malarial drug it's also incorporated into uh, tonic water. Okay, so anyone out there, it's a little early, but if you if you had a gin and tonic in the last couple of days, you've had quinine in your system, gives that bitter principle to the to the water. And for ninety years, we didn't know or we didn't see of any cases of drug resistance. But in 1910, the first case of drug resistance to quinine popped up. There's a large distribution of this drug out in the society. There's some selection pressure on the malaria parasites. And so over time, drug resistance has emerged. And so in the last century, new molecules designed based off of quinine were developed, including chloroquine, something that you may have heard about also recently. Um, this was introduced as a drug in 1945. And by 1957, we were already seeing the first case of drug resistance. So new molecules were designed based on chloroquine, including mefloquine, which is an approved drug also for treating malaria. It was introduced in 1977, and the first case of drug resistance was noted only five years later. So something that we've seen been used as a traditional medicine for centuries, as a Western medicine in the first form for about 100 years, in the second generation for about 10 or 15 years, in the third generation for five years, you can see that there's a problem that's growing. And this problem was well recognized, okay? And luckily some of the work done in the 1970s by a Chinese scientist and team, Professor Tu Yu Yu is shown here on the left side of the screen, to investigate traditional Chinese medicines that had been used for centuries as well. In this case, I think actually for about two millennia, um, for the case of Artemisia annua, these are medicines that were used to treat malaria in China. And they were able to isolate and characterize an absolutely revolutionary molecule car called artemisinin. And you don't need to be an organic chemist to recognize that the shape and structure of this molecule is completely different from what I just showed you. And as one might hypothesize, it binds to totally different proteins in totally different ways. Okay, so the drug resistance that has emerged in malaria to quinine and analogs is not something that we're seeing for artemisinin and the several other analogs that are shown here. It was recognized early that artemisinin is metabolized into dihydroartemisinin, which is an active metabolite, meaning it's still able to kill the malaria parasites. And this molecule is much more amenable to being modified by medicinal chemistry. And so we're tagging on different functional groups on this Southern hemisphere oxygen to change in some ways, improving the drug-like properties of those molecules. And over time, more and more structural analogs have been derived. So for example, our testinate is an orally available drug. So it does not need to be given by injection. And that was recently gained FDA approval for the treatment of malaria here in the United States. And that was a work that was contributed to the FDA by La Jolla Pharmaceuticals, right? So work that's happening right in our backyard based on research that happened on the other side of the world 30, 40, 50 years earlier that investigated their traditional medicines that had been used for thousands of years. So this is where our research is really at and going. And in some cases, you'll see even completely structurally different molecules like arterolane, shown on the far right, which incorporate the knowledge of how artemisinin itself is functioning to kill the, uh, the parasite that causes malaria. Currently, these drugs are the standard of care for quinine-resistant malaria, which is virtually worldwide at this point. And in 2006, the World Health Organization made the strong recommendation, they said requirement, but they don't have enforcement power, 
to actually give all artemisinoids only in combination chemotherapy with other anti-malarial compounds so that the parasites have more and more pressure on them from different angles kind of, and they have no way to build up a resistance to just one at a time. They would have to have wild amounts of mutation or some overwhelming survival mechanism, which we're really not seeing if the drugs are given in combination therapies. Unfortunately, with the commercial availability of these drugs and also the widespread availability of different artemisias, these are the wormwoods that grow virtually everywhere in the world. Not all contain artemisinin, but many do. And so we're starting to see, again, drug resistance to come up. This is terrifying. When artemisinin was discovered and uh, put into medical practice, this was termed as a drug that significantly reduced the death of patients suffering from malaria. In many places, 95% reduction in the death rate caused by malaria. And that's only in the last 20 or so years. Professor Yu Yu um, actually won the Nobel Prize in 2015. She was awarded half of the prize that year for physiology or medicine, and other natural product chemists won the other half for developing another unrelated molecule. I can't understate the importance of the impact of that discovery, especially on malaria. But as we know, you know, it's not the first discovery of, of traditional medicines that's impacted malaria and changed the world. We're seeing billions of people that are at risk to develop malaria, millions of people that are dying each year. And since 2000, it's estimated by our CDC, which has its own history with malaria, that over 10 million lives have been saved, not exclusively by the development of these new chemotherapeutic agents, also through vector control, killing of mosquitoes, installation of bed nets, but all of these things have to happen in a complementary way for all of these people across the world that are at risk of developing malaria. And very interestingly and importantly, as our climate changes, regardless of how that's happening and who wants to take the blame for it, we're seeing the range of the malaria vectors and of the malaria disease actually spreading out into more and more parts of the globe. We're seeing co-infection of malaria with HIV in Europe. It's creeping up into America. People are bringing it home from their vacations. Um, and so we are seeing case rates, even in the so-called Western developed countries where this hasn't historically been a large problem. Now, without a great segue, I did promise I would talk to you about botanical drugs because we recognize now that there are certain benefits to having large mixtures of compounds together in one drug. The first two FDA approved botanical drugs, these are extracts that have been refined. The first is called um, Veragen or syncatechins, which is actually a mixture of catechins and other molecules that are coming out of Camellia sinensis, so the tea plant. It's long been used in food and traditional medicine, of course, and now it's approved as an extract by the US FDA. Another example is the sap of Croton Lecleri, is a tree called dragon's blood. And you can actually see that if you score the, the bark on the outside of the tree, it really does bleed in a way that makes you think that the, the organism is alive like an animal, but of course it's alive, but it's a plant. And so the, the red molecules that are there are in many cases proanthocyanidins and polyphenols. These have been used again for hundreds or thousands of years in traditional medicine. They've been used for wound healing and gastrointestinal disorders. And now the mixture of molecules, which has not even been characterized because of the sheer number of polymers that could be present, has been approved by the US FDA for the treatment um, of genital warts, oh sorry, uh, for Camellia sinensis, for the treatment of genital warts, and for crophelomer, for uh, Croton Leclerc, um, as an anti-diarrheal agent, owing to that rich history of knowledge about its use for gastrointestinal disorders. And so these are just two examples, but over 800 different applications for botanical investigational new drugs have been submitted to the US FDA. So we all hope and expect that many more of these sorts of herbal products are gonna make it onto the US market 
as drugs that could be provided either over the counter in some cases or by prescription from a medical doctor. They still have to go through safety and efficacy demonstrations, clinical trials, and FDA review. So we can trust these in just the same way that we're trusting any other pill bottle. One of the major indications that we've seen traditional medicine and natural products play a role is in cancer chemotherapy. It's important to note that chemotherapy just means therapy using chemicals. And so it is not the assignment of one particular drug or one course of treatments, but it could be many different things. Four different sets of chemotherapeutic agents are shown here, along with the different plants that they have been discovered from. And we could stop and talk about so many stories that owe um, their foundation to these discoveries that are on the screen. Most of this work has been done 40, 50, 60 years ago. And that is a very important thing to realize because at the time there was no major protection for biodiversity or for the protection of indigenous knowledge. So the pharmaceutical companies have turned these literally into billion dollar blockbuster drugs. And in each case that I know about, there has not been a great feedback uh, or benefit sharing to the society or the location um, that provided the knowledge or provided the plant material that ultimately yielded these discoveries. And that's something that we're hoping to change and that actually has been evolving a lot as we'll talk about in a moment. I do want to mention um, that two of these plants, Camptotheca acuminata and Taxus brevifolia, were evaluated in extremely widespread screening programs that were run by the US government to look for originally new sources of cortisone and other molecules, and ultimately tested to see what else could be there and how they could be used to treat different cancers. Um, it makes me a bit uncomfortable to think about how many lab animals like mice and rats probably died through the development of these drugs. Um, but I do feel very good knowing that at the end of the day, this has generated extra time of life for cancer patients all around the country and indeed all around the world. Each of these medicinal plants will be recognized as being potentially poisonous, okay? And that's something that is very important. So in medicine, we think about the therapeutic window. How can we use a molecule for its efficacy before we reach the critical point that it becomes unsafe or toxic? And actually 600 years ago, Paracelsus gave this quote, dosis facet venenum. So the dose makes the poison. Paracelsus was viewed as the father of toxicology, tells us that all substances are poisonous. There is not any substance which is not a poison, and it's just the dose which differs poison from something that's safe or from a medicine. All right, and the example I like to tell people is even water, which we have a very good interaction with, most of our body is you know, containing water, we're drinking a lot of water every day. If you consume too much water or you consume it in the wrong way, this is deadly not only from drowning, but your cells actually can't handle it at a certain point. And there is something called water toxicity. These, of course, are gonna be toxic uh, in much lower doses than water is, right? So that everything has its own dose ratio. Um, but it's just something that we need to be thoughtful about as we utilize traditional medicines and herbal drugs, the same way as we take those into consideration when using things that have gone through FDA approvals. Now, I mentioned the billions of dollars in these blockbuster drugs that pharmaceutical companies have developed. This is a huge economic potential, and that demands legislation, conservation, and adherence to just truly ethical practices, right? So from the dawn of time, there was free chaos, as I like to call it. People were doing everything. Some were just trading and making a benefit for themselves. Uh, armies would come in and pillage and steal, or there would just be outright thefts. And unfortunately, that didn't stop in the early ages. That's still happening to some extent today. But with the development of these drugs in the middle of the last century, there's also been a recognition that biodiversity needs to be protected, not only so that we have more sources of plants and organisms to go discover molecules from, 
but also to recognize who has provided those. So the early conventions were on the um, international trade of endangered species, wild fauna and, and um, flora. And so we call that as CITES. And then that really evolved into um, the Convention on Biodiversity or, or the Rio Earth Summit in the 90s. And each of these conventions, protocols, um, and, and international agreements and accords really comes with the understanding that not everybody is doing what they should be doing. Not everybody agrees to do it, but even those who agree don't necessarily follow the rules. And so more strict monitoring needs to be put into place, um, better adherence protocols, uh, to the point that you can see this group called the Coalition Against Biopiracy, uh, a, a news flyer which was uh, distributed, I guess, on the early days of the internet back then, um, was putting out awards called the Captain Hook Awards, identifying people publicly as biopirates, so that not only would you have to potentially face the, the legal court system, but also the court of public opinion, right? And so this is calling attention to people that are doing the wrong thing, and also potentially stopping research, damaging careers, um, and really reinforcing the idea that biodiversity belongs out in nature. The knowledge that has been developed based on it is traditional and indigenous knowledge that belongs to a people and that there's a huge value to both. And you can't just go to another country and steal their plants. And you can't just go and take somebody's knowledge from an indigenous tribe without really giving something back in terms of access upfront and benefit sharing at the tail end. Now, this has also had some negative impacts because people have to balance out what the expectations are early on. So if we wanna do some basic research, that doesn't guarantee that there's gonna be a billion dollar blockbuster at the end. So we can't offer you a hundred million dollars just to you know, work with some plants, but we are working on different creative ways, which is really culture and society specific to offer something in return for the access and then incorporate benefit sharing for any eventual financial gain that would come out. And this is something that's extremely important to us here at the San Diego Botanic Garden. So let's talk about what we're doing for the rest of the time that we have together. I think that we can all agree that the world needs more medicines. What I'm gonna say is that the world needs old and new medicines. The global population is growing and aging. We're seeing new diseases, we're seeing diseases spread that used to be very minor. Some of these are just being characterized even though they've been around for a long time. As I mentioned earlier, we're seeing drug resistance developing, especially in infectious diseases. This happens in many cases also with cancers, for example, that you have to switch to different therapies if it's coming back. And our biodiversity is under both new and ever-present threats. So loss of habitat, climate change, different pressure on different animals, but we're even seeing human poaching out in the wild to the point that some of our indigenous partners are telling us it's harder and harder to find the medicines, the plant medicines that they used to be able to collect anywhere on their lands because people are coming in and taking them and they're not doing so necessarily responsibly. I know this is all sounding terrible, but the bright side is we can make a difference. All right, and from a botanical garden perspective, we conserve biodiversity in botanic gardens. We enable scientific investigation of many medicinal plants. We're working to reveal the impacts of horticulture practice in drug discovery and to share the knowledge of plants with people of the world. So what does it mean reveal the impacts of horticulture practice in drug discovery? Well, most of our discoveries have been made as single snapshots in time. Imagine taking a picture. You saw a plant out in the wild, you cut it down, you bring it back to the lab. And at that point, the plant is no longer developing. It's no longer in its ecosystem. It's not having its natural interactions. And so whatever chemistry and whatever biology there was at that point that you cut it down and extracted it or froze it or however you chose to treat it, that's what you're gonna be able to observe but we're able to observe the plants as we grow them and monitor them over time and see how growth conditions might actually contribute 
or take away from the medicinal properties of those plants. So let me introduce to you a project that actually hired me into the San Diego Botanic Garden. It's a mouthful. It's called the Creation of a National Medicinal Plants Collection and Research Consortium to Catalyze Drug Discovery in San Diego and Beyond. So this is funded by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, and it's been supplemented with contributions from philanthropic donors here in San Diego. We're very appreciative to, to both and to everyone else who's involved. We have four main pillars of this project that I'm going to talk about one by one. It'll be the development of the medicinal plants collection itself, educational programming, a research consortium, and then doing metabolite and gene discovery that I know is very important and relevant in the biotechnology space here in San Diego. So part of why we're so excited to have the opportunity to do this here, and another part is because our coastal climate and our sort of micro environment allows us to grow virtually any plant that we're interested in. In some cases, in our glass greenhouse, in some cases, in what we're calling our hoop house, sometimes outside and sometimes with heating pads. We have to irrigate, right? We're still in San Diego, but we can grow just about any plant that we can get our hands on. And so that's that first pillar of our research program is to build out a medicinal plants collection that's going to represent plants that are regional and domestic and even international over time. So we're assembling and staffing a comprehensive medicinal plants collection. And as I mentioned, I am 100% dedicated to this project in my hiring. So this is what's paying my salary. And we've also brought on Emma to help grow the plants. And you'll see a picture of her and, and the whole team uh, a few minutes down the line. We're working primarily with medicinal plants of the Southwest, so local plants, medicinal plants of indigenous people, broadly defined. We're starting with our indigenous partners here in San Diego among the Kumeyaay, as well as others that have come to us from regions across the country. And then over time, we hope to expand internationally. And we want to have also a special focus on medicinal plants that have been used in Western medicine from antiquity through now, because not everyone hears this lecture, right? And so they don't, they maybe don't recognize that medicinal plants have founded Western medicine, and they're still thinking of alternative, not complementary. And so we want to be able to share the appreciation of those plants with people. To do this, we've started construction of a greenhouse in a very beautiful location, as I mentioned, Encinitas, just up the five from you. Over time, we have changed this view dramatically. Piece by piece, having a greenhouse installed. It took us certainly longer than I had expected, but they say everything takes longer in a pandemic. We got the electric hooked up. The plants need the fans on them to really grow big and strong. Ground cover has gone in. And actually, tomorrow, we're taking delivery of the tables. We've got plants in waiting to get in there. And so hopefully at some point, I'll have a chance to update you all. Maybe in a year or two, uh, we can come back and have a talk and show you this just completely beautifully decked out with plants. How are we picking those plants? Well, um, on my left or in the picture on the left, if you look behind uh, my nephew who's dressed as a Pikachu, you'll actually see a huge amount of medicinal plant knowledge. A lot of this that's been documented is out there in books. It's not necessarily on web pages. It's not necessarily in peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, it, it's an offhand observation that someone made 300 years ago, and it's just sitting in the literature and we have to find it. So we're looking back into history for those sources. We're also, as I mentioned, working with local indigenous partners. So in yellow here is Richard Bugby, an ethnobotanist from Kumeyaay Community College. In the dress is Lisa Kumper, and she's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Hamel Band of Kumeyaay people from Hamel Indian Village of California. And they're giving us information about the different types of plants that they're using. We're not always asking, what did you use it for? How can we work on making new medicines out of that? Um, that's something that is to come, and we're working on doing that the appropriate way. But just getting the plants, the names of the plants that we need to conserve those plants, to figure out how to grow those plants. We're working with our partners for that. 
And we're taking suggestions from our research partners, from herbal medicine educators, traditional medicine practitioners, and yes, even the public. But those come in the form of suggestions, I have to emphasize. Everything that comes in or out of the garden goes through Jeremy, who's shown here at the back. He's our curator of the collections. He has to make sure that we bring things in the right way, that they're not going to damage the plant collection that we have here that is alive, that they're not going to be threats of being invasive out in nature, and, and all these other considerations that he takes into account before deciding if we will take that suggestion or not. To get these plants, well, we actually have a great conservation and science team here. Mm -hmm. um, they're out doing local field expeditions, and sometimes they're bringing us back little gifts when they have the, the appropriate permits to collect plants and use them in this way. Um, we're also going to be applying for other permits specifically for this purpose in the future, um, as well as we're already engaging with the USDA, other botanic gardens that we're connected to, partner organizations, and having plants or even just seeds of known provenance shared with us that we can grow them and share them with others in the exact same way. Um, in some cases, we're working with commercial vendors uh, for commercial availability of these plants. Um, as long as they're really trusted vendors, select varieties that we know that they have been a, um, acquired correctly, that they're not going to be, you know, again, at risks to the other plants that we have growing here and things like that. So provenance is extremely important for us. We have an excellent team here, um, partially involved in the Medicinal Plants Project and also a larger team that just does the educational programming at the San Diego Botanic Garden. We have programming available already for children and adults, or if you like, children of all ages. Um, if you come for the programs, you will understand why I say they are fantastic in their planning, fantastic in their execution, fantastic in the programming. And we have the aim to develop a medicinal plant demonstration garden where people can interact with medicinal plants and also classes or events can be held to have people understanding better and re receiving educational programming. We have plants in the garden now that have signage that document their traditional uses. On the left is Centranthus ruber. It's in our cork oak grove, um, and this is the red valerian. It's well documented what it does. Camptotheca acuminata, which provided one of those Western pharmaceuticals used for cancer chemotherapy, camptothecin, that we mentioned earlier. Um, and here, oh, that's not, it's not a real psilocybin tree. Um, we've just finished our lightscape, our, our winter night show. Um, and so actually that should look like this. So that's Taxodium mucronatum. Um, it's a tree that's located in our Seeds of Wonder. It has signage. It's not fully describing the medicinal properties of this plant that I actually studied for part of my PhD thesis um, at The Ohio State University. So we're going to be updating some of these signs. You're going to see more and more signs around. Um, and we're working as much as possible to make these bilingual or trilingual um, that they're more accessible for people. And we're working on different ways to improve that as well. In terms of the programming and the classes that we're seeing, um, we now have a space for that in the Incredible Edibles Garden. There's a new healing bed that's been put in. Um, that's part of our Hamilton Children's Garden. And so with regard to the concern for toxicity, we are choosing extremely careful, carefully selected uh, safe plants. So think about, I don't know, rosemary, sage, and thyme. We consider those as being um, culinary, but they're also truly medicinal. Um, and actually, I've heard that the, the education team has come up with something from every letter of the alphabet. So um, with, with time, I hope an A to Z garden grows there that people can interact with the medicinal plants. Um, we've updated a new and improved California herbal garden. Uh, these are recently planted, so a couple of the plants are obvious here right now, and some of them are really going to pop in the spring. And then adjacent to our native plants and native people trail, which already incorporates a lot of indigenous knowledge. It was developed in cooperation with Kumeyaay Partners many years ago um, with signage and documentation in English, Spanish, and Kumeyaay. Um, we're going to add a new medicinal garden just adjacent to that, and so that native plants and native people trail will really represent our, our local medicinal plants, and then adjacent will be domestic or international medicinal plants. And so um, I hope that over time you'll get a chance to come visit us and see that and really enjoy what we have to offer.
Um, as I mentioned, we've already got classes happening. So shown on the left are folk herbal medicine classes uh, with Corinne, who runs Pathlight Healing. Um, by popular demand, she's preparing a high school herbalism class, and she definitely takes into consideration what herbal teas and herbal products are going to be safe for uh, minors versus adults and people of different ages, different backgrounds. Um, so she's extremely well-practiced and thoughtful about that. We're working on a new educational program that will be released uh, later this year uh, that's really going to connect people, I think, in a lot better ways with the traditions and the modern medicines. And then this guy who, oh wait, that's me, um, out and about doing public outreach. So an engagement with like La Jolla Community Center, that's you. Um, but I've also been invited to Solana Beach Eco Rotary, which was a great experience. Um, the Natural Product Affinities Group, which is multi-institutional here in San Diego um, and others. So we're trying to get the word out. We've got a fantastic research consortium that we've put together. Uh, the, the goal is to bring together experts in, both in medicine, genomics, drug discovery, um, even botanists um, to guide our collection, help to facilitate research and development. And this is a picture that shows really how diverse that and large that group already is from the first quarterly consortium meeting, which was just in October of last year. And here's a list of all the different organizations that participated in that consortium meeting. And some of these folks were engaged with on a regular basis. They're doing research together with us, especially I'll highlight the Salk Institute, who's a very close partner. Some of these people are just getting regular communications from us, or some are available for when you know, developments might come on down the line that they could potentially help to commercialize. And we've allowed everybody to express their interest, um, both you know, uh, naturally as, as things progress, uh, and also in, in written statements and uh, declarations of, of interest to work together. With the Salk Institute, as I mentioned, we've prepared some of the legal framework um, for the research and development that we hope to do here. And so one example is a memorandum of understanding that's been prepared here that shows that we want to work together, how we want to work together. And I highlight on this second slide here, right there on the first page of this agreement, everybody said this is so important we have to have it here and now is a commitment to work together ethically correctly and to acknowledge access and benefits sharing that where the plant came from who provided the knowledge is directly important for the foundation of the research program that we aim to do and they're not going to be left out we're bringing people in as equal partners we're also not doing what's called parachute science go give a little money, take plants and never come back. That is not what we're looking for. We are working together in many cases actually to help people to preserve the plants and knowledge used in their traditions and in their cultures from the standpoint of our own nonprofit status and our background expertise in the area. So those plants that are getting harder and harder to find, we hope to figure out how to grow, help the native people to grow them, and repopulate, in some cases, their, their wilderness, or to grow them in greenhouses or agriculturally as permissible. The fourth focus here is on the metabolite and gene discovery, and this is heavily relying on partners over at the Salk Institute. I'll specifically mention Joe Noel, Pam Maher, and Todd Michael, who are working with us on characterizing the genome of some of these plants, the metabolome, so the chemistry that they produce, and also the pharmacology, so the benefit that those molecules may have uh, in the human body. And we have chosen to work in a multi-omic method, genomic, transcriptomic, and metabolomic, to study specific groups of medicinal plants, as I mentioned earlier, under controlled growing conditions. We want to investigate how genetics, seasonality, climate conditions, uh, nutrient availability, water abundance, all of these different growth factors can contribute or detract from the growth development of these plants and the medicinal properties of the extracts that we would pr produce from them. Um, I'm showing here Artemisia californica, which we have growing in our landscape, as well as in our nursery. So you can see how we can propagate these things in smaller uh, segments, right? And we can actually get them into large potted plants if we need to for, for longer term experiments. Um, the Artemisias, as I mentioned earlier, with the connection to Artemisia annua, those are wormwoods. 
Um, they've been used all over the world medicinally for just a huge host of different indications. And so there's a great expanse here that we can study. Joe and others have a lot of experience already working with the genomics and the metabolomics of Artemisia. So this was really pushed forwards in that direction. And Ariodictyon is a Yerba Santa. So this is something that grows up and down California, maybe into Oregon or even Washington and down the coast into Baja, California, and virtually nowhere else in the world, unless we've sent them seeds for, for conservation efforts. According to Calscape and the California Native Plant Society, there's 40 more species of Artemisia that grow here in California and 15 more species of Ariodictyon um, here in California. And we'd ideally like to get multiple individuals from each of those different populations um, that we can really have access to a large host of plants to study in our program. It's not just me. I've talked about a huge amount of work that we're doing and planning to do. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's a public setting and very early in our research program, so I can't give you research results, um, but know that we're going in that direction. I should mention, uh, I'm going to go back one slide, I should mention with the, with the Ariodictyon, we already talked about Artemisia, the Yerba Santa has been used traditionally for a lot of indications I mentioned, um, but one that Pam Maher is particularly interested in uh, is that some of the molecules in this plant appear to be useful for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And we're working with Pam and, and others around town to try to really develop that um, down the direction, whether it's going to be a single entity drug, um, whether you could see this as a botanical product, it's already out on the herbal supplements market. Um, these are things that we hope to really see a large scale impact from in the future. Now again, not just me, teamwork makes the dream work. We've got a great group of folks here at the San Diego Botanic Garden. I already mentioned the names of many of our collaborators. Um, you'll, you're gonna see, I think over time, both our team internally, my hope is to see that grow and the list of collaborators externally also growing because I think what we're doing here is something kind of special. I think it's gonna bring people in and everywhere I go, people end up kind of excited about it. Hopefully you're receiving some of that as well. And I know we'll have time for questions here in just a minute or two. So I, I do wanna say just special thanks to any of my team uh, who may be watching this or may see it in the future later. You're all fantastic and make this make this work fun. To save some time in the questions and answers, um, I like to include this uh, slide about relevant reading material. Uh, people are always interested, where can I learn more or hear more or find out more? Um, and these are four different books that I really like to emphasize. They each bring a different perspective on drug discovery, on natural products, on traditional medicines. Um, the Medicinal Plants of the World book is much more informative, almost like an encyclopedia, also with beautiful pictures. The Plant Hunter is a beautiful story about Cassie Quave, who's a friend of mine in the research community. Um, she's out all over the world looking for, for new plants and back in the lab in Atlanta looking for new molecules, um, but also some of the historical impacts that have been had by these, by these molecules, uh, Napoleon's buttons and drugs that changed the world. A little bit older, but extremely, extremely interesting. For the for the younger of us who, who maybe don't have the, the time or desire to sit down and read through these books, um, there was a 1992 movie called The Medicine Man with Sean Connery, a uh, 2006 movie called The Fountain with Hugh Jackman. Um, these really show the dramatic difference in technology that was available in Hollywood at the time, but both have actual science that's being shown as well as some romanticism and um, science fiction, if you will, but absolutely uh, enjoyable watches. And Cassie uh, not only has this book out, but also a podcast she's been running since 2019, where she talks herself and also with other experts in the area um, about just different topics in food, in medicine, and in traditional uh, plant chemistry. So with that, I'm gonna open the, the time up for questions and discussion. Uh, I'll again acknowledge special thanks um, for supporting our mission from the Conrad Prebis Foundation that funded our research, um, as well as our development and uh, the Dickinson family who has contributed and other private philanthropic donors. So um, I'm not here asking for money, but we are a nonprofit. So if it fits into your giving strategy, we would love to take it. Um, otherwise, I'll just take questions uh, as long as our moderators will allow for. Thank you all for, for attending today and, and for your attention so far. 
Thank you, Dr. Neiman. Thanks so much for enlightening us about the San Diego Botanic Garden and all you do. I think we all learned a great deal. And of course, we're excited to visit. So can you tell us a little bit about how the best way to go is um, in regards to visiting or learning about some of the programs you offer? Absolutely. Let me uh, stop the video just so, oh, trying to stop my share, not my video. Um, just so I can see you all a little bit better. Um, yeah, so you know we've we've got a good presence online, www.sdbg.org, and the team does a fantastic job keeping a calendar up to date with the events that are available. Um, some of those are online, but many are are really in person at this point. Um, we we've, we've been benefited at the garden by being mostly outdoors, and so the the botanic garden even before I joined last May. Was, was one of the first organizations to reopen through the pandemic and help people to be out in nature and interacting with each other, but also with plants. Um, please come visit us. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're open uh, from, from Wednesday to Monday. We're, we're closed every Tuesday for work. Uh, you can find our hours online, but they should be back to nine to five now that the, uh, now that the Lightscape show is over. If you, if you didn't have a chance to visit our Lightscape over the winter, uh, I expect it to come back probably in, in November or so of, of the year. Um, winter is coming, so hopefully you can come back for that too, and you'll see the plants in a totally different light. Great, thank you. And if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to use the chat function, and we'll go ahead and go through those. There is a question from Helen. She says, have you connected with California Native Plant Society? Um, thank you. So I personally have not. I'm aware of them. Um, our curator and our conservation staff is connected very well with the California Native Plant Society, and I know they've even presented at and attended some of those meetings. Um, so, so they could be seen kind of as partners, but um, really we're going to them for specific things, especially like plants. Um, and so uh, probably I should get more involved, and I, I appreciate that suggestion, um, but, but they're certainly aware of what we're doing, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see another question from anybody, so if anyone else wants to send a question, we'll have another minute or so with Dr. Naiman if there's anything coming in. Um, Dr. Naiman, I appreciate you explaining um, I will implement complementary, not alternative medicine to my vocabulary. That was a great tip and very true, so thanks for that. You know what, this has already been a productive day then. Um, yes. You know, it's... Again, with the, the impact of words, words have meaning and those words, the meaning of those words has power. So um, we really want to enable everybody to just live a healthy lifestyle. Absolutely. Um, I just see claps and thank you. So I'm going to assume there's not another question. So again, Dr. Neiman, thank you so much for your presentation and your time. Uh, very enlightening and we're all excited. Oh, there is, there is one question. Oh. There's a few questions that are coming in, so I will. All right, I'll, I'll stick around. Names. I'll stick around. <laughs> okay. uh, have you? Uh, this is from Anne. Have you run across this book by a well-respected toxicologist who used the work for both FDA and USDA? Uh, it's called "A Natural Mistake: Why Natural, Organic, and Botanic Products Are Not a, as Safe as You Think" by James T. McGregor. Um, I have not run across that book, but I will definitely make a note of myself to check it out. Um, you know. I do have opinions in the area, and so I, I think in a lot of ways people don't necessarily know what those words mean, again, with the, the importance of, of meaning of words. Um, and, you know, I, I do emphasize that people don't assume that natural means safe. I also encourage people to realize that synthetic does not mean toxic or dangerous. Um, you know, there, there's tons of examples on, on both sides of that kind of spectrum. Um, where a natural molecule might be totally poisonous, where a synthetic molecule would be totally safe. And so um, it, it really has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and people have to be careful. And certainly in the botanical um, dietary supplement market, there are great examples of companies that are having rigorous quality control, and there are unfortunately a lot of examples of companies that really don't take care that what you think is natural and organic and local and gluten-free and whatever else you want to call it, uh, the label might be false. And so, you know, you, you need to find a trusted source. Great. Thank you. There's another question from um, Claudio. What would, the, what would be the advantage of growing plants in your household over collecting them? Oh, in your hothouse, sorry. Uh, what would be the advantage of growing plants in your hothouse over collecting them in the field when they are abundant? 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And so part of this is science that we're, we're working on and part of it is science that, that's understood out there and part of it is also just social. Um, so unfortunately, one of the things that's happened in the past when some of these uh, traditional medicines, when some of these medicinal plants become popularized is that people go out into the wild and they're basically pillaging, um, but foraging and, and something that was abundant all of a sudden becomes threatened. And that can happen in some cases uh, just in a matter of, of years, right? We're not talking about decades or centuries. And so for us to be able to cultivate those is very important for conservation from one aspect. Um, from another, you, you're absolutely right. If, there, if there's an abundant set of plants out in the field, we can go and collect large quantities. We can study those for chemistry um, and, and have a great potential come from them. And I, I don't wanna detract from that science at all. I've actually done a lot of that work in my own background, right? So in my career. Um, what we're looking to do is a little bit different because we can do very close either controlling or monitoring of the growth conditions, as well as monitoring of the genetic expression and the chemistry that's produced and really start to analyze what is yielding that medicinal effect, not only from the chemical perspective, but what makes the plant do that, right? And see if we can upregulate that in the future. And so some plants need more sunlight, some plants need more shade, and we'll be able to have some of those controls, um, as well as you know the salinity of the soil or um, nutrients that get added or removed from our media and things like that. Uh, and so what I, what I think that we're gonna be able to really show very well uh, is that by knowing how to grow the plants, we can also modulate the plants and sort of control, you know, puppeteer um, those plants to make the molecules that we really want them to. Thank you. Another question is, our region is semi-desertic. How rich is our flora? Are there plant families that have not been studied in other parts of the world? Um, yeah, that is a, an outstanding question, um, and I'm just going to make a note to myself to incorporate that in my next presentation. Um, so San Diego is a really interesting place, and, and I moved here from the Northeast, and I had lived in the Midwest, and I thought, I'm, I'm moving to the desert. Uh, and what I actually found, what we know to be here, are just so many different microclimates. It's a word that like didn't exist for me before I moved to California. And so, yes, we have desert, but we also have coastal. Um, we, we've got sea level and valleys. We've also got high mountains. And so the outcome of all of that are that these, these niche little areas of microclimates that have um, the largest biodiversity concentration of any county in the entire United States. And I used to think that was the continental United States, but someone corrected me and said, no, no, no. It's more than Hawaii, it's more than, you know, some of our territories like Puerto Rico and Samoa and things like that. Um, we've got tons of plants, tons of animals, just all sorts of biodiversity available to us right here in San Diego, some of which doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, but to the, to the other part of the question, there are, I don't know if there are entire plant families that have not been studied in other parts of the world. There probably are. Um, and taxonomy is also an issue because a lot of the plants that are out there have just never even been observed uh, and categorized into what we call the taxonomic nomenclature system. So as people are out exploring new places and interacting with new groups of people, um, if we can keep botany as being a, a popular topic for students to study, um, we're gonna see the description of more and more plants, probably plant families as well, um, that have never even been seen, much less much less studied. And so, um, honestly, I think we've only scratched the surface of what's available to us for for chemistry and for for medicine. Um, and and hopefully, we have a chance to do that before the biodiversity uh, is disappearing, because we know we are, you know, seeing extinctions, seeing climate change, and other things like that. Thank you. Another question from Wendy is, will you share one or two natural supplement companies you would recommend that have rigorous manufacturing practices? Many thanks for your presentation. Um, <laughs> that is a very complicated question, but I will share the name of, of one company that I have interacted with in the past and feel comfortable with. Um, don't take this as an advertisement. I'm not on the payroll. 
Uh, but Nature's Sunshine is a company that was connected to the, the group that I worked with for my PhD studies at Ohio State University. Um, I was well aware of a lot of the quality standards that they were doing, and they would actually send us materials of, of new products that they were considering putting on the market um, to look into for like antioxidant potential and some of the chemistry that might be present and things like that. Um, we did some toxicity studies and things just to make sure that they might be safe products. Um, that said, I know that, uh, I don't know, Procter & Gamble is huge in this space. Um, they're incorporating herbal products into some of their consumer goods, you know, creams and shampoos and things like that. Um, I have a lot of trust in that company. Um, but after that, I think I better save myself some face and and not talk about anybody else. There, there are good ones out there. Um, and as I said, you know, there, there are FDA recalls and you can find out which ones are the bad ones. Thank you. There's the um, question about um, the transcript for this video, and it's actually going to be available on our website for about seven to 10 days from today. But it was Elizabeth who missed the names of the recommended books. Uh, Dr. Naiman, are you are you able to uh, put that um, slide back on the screen with the recommended books? Um, yeah, I think I can do that. Give me one second here. Oh, we will have the video up on our website in, uh, like I said, seven to ten days. But there it is, Elizabeth. If you want to do a screenshot or take a take the names down, that would be great. Uh, Wendy says yes. I remember Nature Sunshine. Thank you. Great. Yeah, um, and it, again, by oh. the way, I just will add. There's a ton of books out there. These are not the only ones. They're just ones that I like to highlight. Um, and despite Cassie being a friend of mine, I've got a signed copy of her book. I'm not getting a kickback if you if you buy this from her or from anyone else. So, um, you know, commercial disclosures. Got it. All righty. I think that's um, I think that's all the questions. And thank you again, Dr. Neiman, for your time. A great presentation. We appreciate you, and we really enjoyed learning about the San Diego Botanic Garden. And hope to visit you soon. Thank you all for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you everyone for being here and. Hopefully in the future we can uh, be in person, but I love the programs you guys put on and I hope to attend more in the future. Thank you. Take care, everyone.